mistakenly dismissed as easy, landscape photography is about light and not just a landscape. Furthermore, this is compounded by an ignorance of what we are photographing or where a place is and how to get there. I have even met photographers who have heard about the Lake District and Peak District, but don't know where they are in the UK. We are drawn to honeypots, overlooking what is around the corner. Satnavs don't help, very good for getting from A to B, but not so helpful for a wider picture. This has led to a situation where many people today, and not just photographers, cannot read an ordnance survey map or understand its symbols. It is that knowledge that will unravel the hidden gems of our landscapes. Let's start there, because we haven't left home yet, or we shouldn't have anyway. So get the maps out or go and buy one. W. H. Smith and Waterstones sell them, or borrow one from the local library. St. Martha's Hill, surmounted by a church, is a favourite viewpoint. It is near Guildford, in Surrey, where I have taken many photographs under a variety of conditions. I would use the OS roadmap to arrive, which is also available in book form, or Land Ranger 186, if I had a good idea where St. Martha's Hill is, as the scale of mapping is larger. It shows car parks and land contours, warning you that a hill still has to be climbed, shown more clearly on the Explorer map, which are best for walkers. I prefer to be guided by a paper map, but these maps are available digitally for smartphones and will show your current location. Having arrived and gazed at the view, you might wonder what the prospect promises. The backdrop are the Surrey Hills, and again the map show car parks. If Google research has been conducted beforehand, you will know that Blackheath is a good location for a walk, and so is Winterfold Wood and Hurtwood, and nestling in the valley is Pees Lake, but no lake. Well, I cannot see one on the map, and I will leave the vegetable reference to your imagination, as so often happens in a place name. The village just over there, now that is part of Chilworth, and although not in view, the explorer map show Albury, Albury Park and Shear, all worth a visit that will occupy the whole day. Albury Park has a church, and if you have done your research, you will know that it has Saxon origins, a rare feature and very photogenic. By the way, the hill peeking over the horizon far right, now they are the South Downs, which neither the Land Ranger nor Explorer maps extend to, but they are shown on the OS road map. There are many walks from St. Martha's Hill, and this part of the North Downs Way, as indicated on the map, is a right of way. Very important, because it can be traversed at any time. The more energetic may wish to climb St. Martha's Hill from Chilworth, after, of course, arriving by train. If you do, use Downs Link. It is less steep and I know that from bitter experience. I have published a YouTube video about this walk. Now, north of the village are the remains of a gunpowder factory that can be visited. For some reason, the Ordnance Survey don't show it. Perhaps they will catch up one day, or maybe my map is out of date. Having arrived, we want to see the view, don't we? So pick the right day. I have walked up here when the weather was foul, but I didn't leave it to chance, you know. I studied the weather forecast first. This is where photographers who don't understand landscape photography suddenly become unstuck. Yes, I know, a landscape won't run away, will it? But the lighting making it look rather interesting, courtesy of weather, often does. 
I have quite a library of maps, all ordnance survey, which I regard the best in the world for detail and clarity. If I haven't got a map of a certain place that I'm going to, I buy one. But I can access them all on my computer, as I also have an account with Anquet, well worth investigating, because with the digital version, you also get the GPS signal on your smartphone or iPad. But I am, yes, I know, old-fashioned, and still prefer surveying the scene with a paper version at bedtime, which I think I'd better leave to your imagination, you know. I haven't mentioned the camera yet, which you may regard as most important. Although I am drawn to Olympus and OM system, any quality camera will do, especially if the image is going to be used commercially or competitively. You might get away with a smartphone for the latter, but I wouldn't rely on it. Lens choice is important, and I tend to use a zoom over the mid-range. Currently, the Zuiko 12-100 Pro lens. It has an image stabilizer, and so has my camera, the OMD EM1 Mark II, so the use of a tripod is unnecessary. I don't go tramping around the country with a load of gear I probably won't use. But there are exceptions, like a teleconverter, which I can slip into my pocket. I have had many handheld photographs reproduced in books, magazines, and calendars, but I don't tell the client, as they might also have a fixed idea about hand-holding, that today is largely irrelevant and out-of-date due to the image stabilizer. Much can also be said about filters, due to programs like Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop. They don't do everything but have the major advantage that you can backtrack when things don't work out. Art never stands still, so I don't want to tie my hands too much by the way I set the camera controls. The way I take a picture might be okay for one client, but not everyone else. And by the way, don't, no, don't over-photoshop your images either. I see many landscape images taken with an extreme wide-angle lens, but it has become a bit of a photographic cliché. It does add drama to a view exaggerating the perspective between foreground and background. But, you know, if you have a 3,000-foot mountain in the background, then optically it is rendered as a molehill. Instead, I tend to go no wider than... 12 millimeters, that's in micro four thirds, 24 millimeter in full frame and film. I am planning a photo shoot to Durham in March. My library lacked an explorer map, so I purchased one, plus an authoritative book about the county to get my facts right on YouTube. Furthermore, I have pre booked an advance first-class return ticket from LNER, London King's Cross to Durham, for £98, and overnight accommodation in an ensuite room with cooked breakfast for £45. If there is a rail strike, I get a full refund, so I've thought about that already. A few days before departure, I will prepare an itinerary after further research. I will certainly cover the cathedral and castle, but I am there for two days, so needing a plan beyond the obvious highlights, and a plan B if it rains. Keep an eye open for the premiere, probably in April.